Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the IWM this evening. My name is Kate Younger. I am a permanent fellow here at the IWM and the research director of our program, Ukraine and European Dialogue. I'm very glad to welcome you here this evening. President Fisher, thank you for being here. Ivan, thank you. And Misha, thank you for being here. Um, in the summer of 1990, at a rather remarkable moment in history, a plucky young institute, eight years old at the time, put together a rather remarkable event. The conference Central Europe on the Way to Democracy brought together leading intellectuals and politicians from across Europe, North America, and the Soviet Union to discuss the future. What lay ahead for politics, for economics, for civil society? And how would these men, for as you'll see in the photos, they were mostly men, make the transition from vocal critics of the communist regime to governing figures? <clears throat> as the IWM marks its 40th anniversary this year, we decided it would be an apt moment to look back on an event, and indeed a moment in history, that cemented the IWM as a home for intellectual exchange, independent of, as our founding rector, Krzysztof Michalski, put it, any ideology, church, bureaucracy, or political party, and reinforced how vital that exchange would continue to be in this new European constellation. At a moment when the face of Europe is transformed again in truly dark ways these days, we see this mission as vital for the for coming 40 years as well. This evening, we have three distinguished guests here to speak with us about that moment in history and this moment in history. To start from my left, Ludger Hagedorn, IWM Permanent Fellow and head of the Patrzka program here, who reports that in the summer of 1990, he was in Berlin, unless he happened to be on holiday those days. Dariusz Stola, Professor of History at the Institute of Political Studies of the Polish Academy of Sciences and former director of the Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews, currently an IWM Fellow, and vice president of the IWM board. In the summer of 1990, he, interestingly, was serving in the Polish army. And Timothy Garten Ash, professor of European studies at the University of Oxford, who had, in the summer of 1990, made a name for himself as one of the most astute chroniclers of the events of 1989 across Central Europe, as gathered here in the Magic Lantern in the IWM library. He took part in the conference as a fellow of St. Anthony's College and a corresponding member of the IWM. This evening, I will give the floor to Timothy first for a few remarks. Ludger and Darish will provide comments in re response, and then we'll begin the discussion. At the end, I'll say just a little bit more about the exhibition itself, which is the reason that we're gathered here today, and then ultimately invite you to join us for wine and cheese and the chance to take a clo closer look at the exhibition. So first, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Kate. You mentioned two years, 1989 and 2022, that changed the face of Europe. And the first thing I'd like to encourage you all to do is to go and look at the faces on the photographs which make up the main part of this exhibition, because they are the faces of a great generation. The equivalents in Central and Eastern Europe of the generation of Churchill and Adenauer and de Gaulle and de Gasperi and Schumann and Monet, who made Western Europe after 1945. Bronisław Geremek, Karol Schwarzenberg, Andrzej Pleszu, Leszek Kołakowski, Krzysztof Michalski himself, Rita Zusmut, Karol Schwarzenberg, Ralf Dahndorf, Pierre Asner, an extraordinary generation, uh, all of them like that first post-war generation, shaped by personal experience of adversity. Just to take one of them, Bronisław Geremek, I think he's on this floor, just there. Um, born 1932, child of someone who was a, um, a synagogue preacher, uh, spent some years of his childhood in the Warsaw Ghetto, saw the world of his childhood, as he put it, go up in flames before his eyes, um, was smuggled out of the Warsaw Ghetto just in time, uh, in high summer, uh, but so thin that, as he described it himself later in life, he had to wear four sweaters, and even then he was shivering in the tram, so everyone could see that this was a kid who'd escaped from the Warsaw Ghetto. Then adopted by his stepfather, 
who was a very decent Polish Catholic, so he grew up in his formative years as a Polish Catholic. Then as a young man joined the Polish Communist Party, which he left in protest after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. Uh, and then, of course, in August 1980, becomes one of the key intellectual advisors to Lech Wałęsa in the movement that would soon be called Solidarność, was a key advisor to Solidarity through the 1980s, an absolute architect of the round table negotiations, key architect of the round table negotiations that brought Poland to democracy. Then as foreign minister, signed the act of accession of Poland to NATO, um, campaigned very strongly for Poland to join the EU, whereupon he himself became a member of the European Parliament and then tragically but symbolically died on the road to Brussels, driving himself on the road to Brussels. One of the truly great Europeans of the second half of the 20th century, someone I was proud to know and hugely admired. I remember once he was showing me around the same, the Polish parliament, and we were talking about Europe, and suddenly he stopped and turned to me and said, you know, for me, Europe is something like a platonic essence. This was someone who truly believed in Europe through his whole biography and drew, drove forward the rebuilding of Europe after 1989. And then, of course, Lech Wałęsa, who was, in a way, the central figure of the conference, but, but also someone, uh, as I'm sure Darius Stoller will remind us, around whom there was already a certain controversy. Um, Lech was a great figure at this conference, um, not only because the war at the top between the leaders of Solidarity had already started, um, but also because he wanted to see Vienna. And so a, a very nice Polish lady who lived in Vienna showed him around. And she told us afterwards there was a great moment when she showed him the statue of Maria Teresa. And a few minutes later, Lech Wałęsa said, hmm, interesting that Mother Teresa already has a statue. <laughs> he was thinking ahead about who, 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 who gets statues. And then on the wall, I think, downstairs towards the cellar, there's a young guy, bearded guy, who looks remarkably like my younger son, Alec, who's a 30-something journalist and writer in a very oppressive regime called China. Um, but the inscription underneath says Timothy Garton Ash, so apparently it's meant to be me. I do vaguely remember this young guy, or probably misremember him, because that's what we do. Uh, it was a fantastic privilege to be at this conference with all these great historical figures. I think Hans Rauscher, who is here, is the only other person um, with us today who was actually at the conference. Um, Wordsworth famously said of the French Revolution, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. And Misha Glenny, who accompanied me on this journey, remembers that very well. But the very heaven, the bliss, was 1989. This conference was, as I have the conference program here, 28th of June to 2nd July, 1990. And that was no longer euphoria. Everybody goes on about the liberal triumphalism at the end of the Cold War. Not true. After the brief moment of, of triumph and excitement, by summer 1990, we were all quite worried. I, I, I found, looking back, that what I actually wrote about this conference, which was called Central Europe on the Way to Democracy, was optimistically called Central Europe on the way to democracy. And what I said was, we know where Central Europe is coming from, but we don't know where it was going to. And the joke at the time, as many of you will remember, looking at the absolutely awesome problem of transition in a system where virtually all private property had been abolished, all democratic institutions had been abolished, all independent media had been abolished except um, except for Samizdat or exile, 
um, media, the rule of law had been abolished, all the checks and balances of a liberal democracy had been abolished. The joke was, we know that you can turn an aquarium into fish soup, but can you turn fish soup back into an aquarium? And we were really worried that, that wasn't going to work. And the moment of triumphalism and of, I would say with hindsight, hubris, was not 1990 or 1991, it was the early 2000s. When we thought, mission accomplished, we've recreated the aquarium, a pretty odd sort of aquarium in every country, but nonetheless an aquarium, some pretty weird fish, and quite a few small sharks, but nonetheless, we've recreated the aquarium, these countries are coming into NATO, they're coming into the EU, they were, we fondly hoped, consolidated democracies. And of course, it's when you put up a sign saying mission accomplished, as George W. Bush did after the invasion of Iraq, that the trouble starts. Warning, don't put up signs saying mission accomplished, right? And, um, you know, looking back, and as I mentioned yesterday or the day before, I'm working, just finished a personal history of contemporary Europe. Looking back, you can see that it's been precisely this moment when we relaxed and thought we'd arrived, that the problem started. I mean, first intimations, the French and Dutch referendums on the European Constitutional Treaty, but then in earnest from 2007-8, simultaneously the global financial crisis and Georgia, the seizure of, of Abkhazia and South Ossetia by Putin, the first intimation of what we're seeing in Ukraine today. And from that time forward, you have crisis after crisis after crisis. Financial crisis segues into Eurozone crisis, uh, Ukraine crisis 2014, refugee crisis, Brexit, populism in Poland and Hungary, Trump crisis, COVID crisis, and now the war in Ukraine. I mean, one blow after another. And whereas in the 1980s and early 90s, you had a, a, a kind of upward spiral where seemingly independent developments like, for example, the arrival of Gorbachev in Moscow and Jacques Delors in Brussels doing the agenda of the single market in 1992 are mutually reinforcing in a beneficial way because the agenda of 1992 greatly increased the attractiveness of Western Europe to Central and East Europeans and indeed to Russians. Now it's the other way around. Now even separate developments like Georgia and financial crisis or refugee crisis and Eurozone crisis reinforce the downward spiral to the worst point so far, which is of course the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, Historians have to be careful in rather quickly going to describe the world historical significance of events, right? So remember, we were only just finished saying that COVID was a turning point in world history. And before that, the election of Trump was a turning point in world history. And before that, the financial crisis was a turning point in world history. And before that, 9-11 was a turning point in world history. So watch out declaring too fast turning points in world history. Nonetheless, I'm going to risk it and say that I think the 24th of February 2022 bookends a period that begins on the 9th of November 1989, what I call the post-war period, and is of course directly connected to it because the big mistake we made in that sort of complex of hubris and, and self-satisfaction was not NATO enlargement, was not EU enlargement. It was not all along to anticipate that when a mother country, or if you like, a fatherland, loses the largest surviving European empire, namely the Russian Soviet empire, in three years with hardly a shot fired in anger, there is almost certain to be a very strong revanchist reaction sooner or later, and probably a violent one. And that's a lesson we should have learned from history. We should not have assumed that this will just go on peacefully being accepted.
uh, by Russia. Losing an empire is hard to do. I, I think Austria has some experience of that, if I may say so. Britain certainly has some experience of that. Um, Hungary has some experience of that. And um, that is the original fundamental motivation for Vladimir Putin. I've said this to one or two of you before, but I met Vladimir Putin in 1994, totally unknown deputy mayor of St. Petersburg. He was already talking about the lost Russian territories outside the Russian Federation. He explicitly mentioned Crimea. The revanchist post-imperial impasse was already there. Then comes 2004-05, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, and on top of the post-imperial reaction comes the fear that a flourishing sovereign democracy is going to emerge on Russia's front doorstep. And those are the two fundamental reasons behind what Putin is doing today. We can talk about other contributory factors, and I, I do acknowledge that one of the contributing factors is the very ill-advised decision at the Bucharest summit of NATO in 2008 to say that Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO but not do anything at all about it. The worst of both worlds. And actually, in my view, that was a beginning of a period in which the West as a whole entered a period of strategic confusion and disorientation when we didn't know where we were going. What happens in Ukraine is, of course, a tragedy. We talked about this two days ago, so I won't repeat what I said here, what we all said here. We'd said never again in Europe. It happened in former Yugoslavia. We said never again after Srebrenica, and it's happened again. But what I do want to say in conclusion is that every crisis is an opportunity. And the opportunity that we face is, if we can enable Ukraine to defend most of its territory, to be in a really strong position through the, with the help of our weapons and our sanctions, um, to achieve whatever is the best peace it can achieve, and it has to be up to Ukraine to decide what that peace is, it can't be up to us, then we have a chance, if we ourselves in Europe have the imagination and the strategic vision, to return to the vision of a Europe whole and free, which we had in the 1990s, and then in my view really lost after 2007-8. The key to this is ourselves to get serious again about EU enlargement. Ourselves to want it. They want it. President Zelensky makes that absolutely clear every time he talks to any European leader. But for ourselves to want it, which means we have to be serious about finally getting uh, delivering on an enlargement for the Western Balkans, with rigorous conditions, of course, doing it properly, but nonetheless, and Moldova and Georgia. And what that offers, and this is my final word in this introductory set of introductory comments, is in a way a chance to go back to that moment we had here at the IWM, or to be precise in the Stock Exchange, in a conference entitled Central Europe on the Way to Democracy. Because Central Europe, as you know, is if not exactly a movable feast, certainly a mo geographically movable concept. It has its cultural and historical identity, but it's also an expression of the will of countries, as Kundera, Kundera said, stuck in the east to come towards the west, so that Ukraine and Moldova now self-identify as Central European countries. So let me end by suggesting that maybe after this terrible war is over and hoping that it ends as well as is possible, maybe it will be time for another conference at the IWM on Central Europe on the way to democracy. But this time we'll be talking about Ukraine and Moldova and Georgia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn the floor over now to Darius. Well, thank you very much. Uh
uh, I must say that uh, Cathy asked me right before uh, this conversation what I did in 1989, and let me pay homage as Tim has paid to, to Geremek and other participants of the conference to a, to a lieutenant of the Polish army whose name I, I have forgotten, who the day before the uh, June 1989 elections in Poland allowed me a, a simple soldier completely against all military regulations to speak at the morning roll call, and he left. So I had my two minutes to spread the horrible subversive propaganda against the soldiers of the Communist Polish Army. And the next day, they indeed voted very much. They elected Jacek Kuro into the Polish parliament. And this way, I know that the government cannot use the army as it had in 1981 during the martial law. So this unknown lieutenant who risked his career to help with this event. And I suppose there are many such people. And now when I watch the Russian army in Ukraine, I wonder, are there any lieutenants like this? And I, and I don't know. You know. This is something which we don't know. We will know it afterwards. For the time being, not so many. Uh, going back to the, to the exhibition we have started with, is watching these faces, these young faces. You, I, I'm a historian, so I immediately think in terms of cycles. You have the life cycles. People who are young are no longer. You know, watching Adam meeting young, actually younger than me at present. I always thought him about something mature. Uh, so there are life cycles, there are economic cycles, there are political cycles, elections or longer. Uh, but it seems to me that some ideas remain young and vital after these 30 years, some of them. And if you visit the exhibition, you can actually see uh, comments given by the participants at the conference, and those of them that refer to freedom and breaking away from the empire. And there was a couple of visitors from the Baltic, Soviet Baltic republics at that time. We're openly speaking about it. And Marcin Krul said, well, we have heard so many times from our Western friends that don't go too far. Don't risk, don't go too far. And he said, we, the Poles, we cannot say this to the Lithuanians. This is up to them to say. And I think we are in a similar moment. We, this is not the time to teach Ukrainians anything about they shouldn't do to go too far. This is up to them to decide when they are going to achieve any more or less lasting solution of the conflict with the Russians or not. This is completely up to them, and none of us should push them to any such decision. Uh, what is also interesting when we, when we uh, read the comments of the, uh, of the participants is that some of them were really perceptive. Uh, I would say prophetic. Bronisław Garemek stressing that he believes that the great hope he has experienced, that as a historian, he is a pessimist. Historians should be pessimists. But the Solidarity Movement was based on the idea of, the, of hope. Hope is not rational. It's a virtue. Hope is a virtue. You hope against predictions. So predicting the end of the communist regime in Poland and the end of the Soviet Union in the 1980s was irrational. It didn't have a solid basis. But there was a massive hope about it, and it happened. So he said that he has still the hope that Lech Wałęsa and the Solidarity Movement will keep protecting this movement for change in his country, which was far from clear in summer of 1990, when from allies they were becoming enemies, Geremek and, and Lech Wałęsa. And speaking about the life cycles, if Lech Wałęsa happened to have an accident in 1990, he would have had statues like Maria Teresa in every Polish town. Now it's unlikely because his opponents effectively undermined his good name, slandered him systematically year after year, so re removed him from the pantheon, not internationally, but, but certainly in Poland. There are many people who no longer trust Lech Wałęsa, so this is another, another cycle to speak. But most interesting for me were the false predictions when people were wrong in 1990, it tells us much more about this time than good predictions. Good predictions, they happen. Someone was right. And for me, the most interesting was one by Jeffrey Sachs, one of the participants, who said, let me quote him, I would predict that in 10 years we will look back and ask, why did the miracle of economic growth occur in Eastern Europe? 
and all the analysis will say that's because the political fights were reduced by the very equal distribution of income and wealth. So there were many energies unleashed by the implosion of the communist regime, and many hopes were opened by the implosion of the communist regime. But it seems to be that one of the animals unleashed was the power of the market economy, which was so much important to the end of the communist regime, to the hopes and to the whole process, it seems to me that most of the talking about the political aspects was about securing an effective economic transformation with political means. That means the economic transformation was the objective and the, and the, and the policy about it, political institutions were to, were to secure it. So that was, that was a force which was stronger than anyone present in this room and stronger than Jeffrey Sachs could, could actually predict. And this really glorious, optimistic idealism that we may have an egalitarian capitalism in Eastern Europe. I, I cannot imagine something more wrong than, than this prediction. This is not to criticize Jeffrey Sachs. It's to show the moment of great hopes, and each of the participants has his or her own hopes. So an, an economist coming from Western Europe has this kind of hopes. You really at this moment realizing that some equality in terms of income and, and the distribution of wealth would be useful. Uh, I was confused when Tim has just said that something wrong happened about the year 2000. The mission accomplished this feeling of the relaxation, which I also, I, I enjoyed it, I must say. And I was thinking the rest of my life will be boring. We had a revolution, it prevailed, we've done it. The rest of my life will be boring. I should take care of my kids. You know, there will be differences in terms of 3 or 5% of the tax, maybe 6.7% of the tax. That was the, the problems of the future. However, if, if you're right that something wrong happened, but let me stress that there were different perceptions of this great transformation. And for many people, the most important consequence of the transformation was unemployment. If, you know, now, as a social historian, when I'm thinking about the past 30 years, when the transformation period ended, in Poland, it ended very recently with the end of the structural unemployment. For the first time since 1989, we had two-digit unemployment up to the early 2000s. And now it's practically, you know, it's 3%, so it's natural unemployment. It's very low. So 1990s were actually a very difficult period. It was after the 2000s with the European accession and a number of factors made life easier. Life became easier and more happy afterwards, but exactly at this time, the problems of today started to grow, as I understand. So depending to the, from which perspective you, you watch at this, as these developments, which Timothy so, has so eloquently presented, well, should I you know, revise my feeling of stability and happiness? Maybe. Maybe I should, but you know, from, from the perspective of 10 years of very hard work, exhaustion, a certain fatigue with the transformation, many people are really happy that we have reached a shore eventually, which probably wasn't there yet. So uh, let me add with, with, with a comment, speaking about Bronisław Geremek in the Warsaw Ghetto, there is a wisdom I learned from a survivor of a Nazi concentration camp who was a young man, was actually selected to the links, to the gas chamber as too weak to remain the prisoner. But when the German officers turned away, he jumped back to the group on the, on the, on the, re, on the right side. And he said, you know, I was just lucky. It was just sheer luck. But if I didn't try, I wouldn't have known I was lucky. And I think this is something about 1990 in Central Europe 30 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Ludger, I'll let you chime yeah. in too. Um, Victor Orban, who was, uh, as you all know, very recently uh, not only re-elected, but did win the elections with a majority that very few people expected. Victor Orban did not only win this election, but on several occasions he has clearly shown his contempt for the Ukrainian case. There was one remarkable uh, interview that he gave to a TV just before the elections, and in this interview, when being asked about the war in Ukraine, um, he said, uh, what we are seeing here, this is the big Slavic oceans. 
and I have never cared about how many na nations there are within this big Slavic ocean. This is his position. Uh, we very well understand what he uh, wants uh, to, to tell us. Uh, uh, this, this, is, this is one nation who, who should really be concerned about this folkloristic subtleties, let them do their folkloristic subtleties, but this is not our business and basically give the Russians free hand, right? Why to mention Auburn here? Um, I think this position that he is advocating here by now uh, is very clearly a almost extremist position, a very lonely position. We might still find similar attitudes in uh, Western European, on the, in the right-wing politicians or left-wing politicians, very few of them still exist. But nevertheless, I think it is a very indicative statement because it tells us something. It tells us something, not only how some people still see this today, but how very many people used to see it until very recently. And I am speaking here, and this is, as you all know, in the discussion now, very much the case that Germany is heavily criticized for uh, being a bit um, slow with sanctionings, etc. And you may have heard about the Ukrainian ambassador in uh, Germany who is playing a very decisive role here, provoking German politicians, especially provoking uh, President Steinmeier, and uh, very successfully so, I have to say. Steinmeier has, uh, I think yesterday or today, he made a statement where he Yes, today, where he tried to yesterday, where he tried to excuse himself, and he admitted that very much of his politics over recent years uh, was led by a misjudgment. And he said, "I would never have expected this willingness on the side of Vladimir Putin, this willingness for a total economic, political, and moral ruin." That he is saying. First of all, let me say, I think, to speak for in favor of Steinmeier, I think it is a remarkable statement. And uh, f far too often we do hear statements from politicians omitting their own mistakes. So in that sense, I think it is a very remarkable statement that is good in itself and it shows a certain process of learning about the situation. Nevertheless, I think, and this is still what immediately was the answer of the Ukrainian ambassador, this is not enough. And what he really accuses him is of a neglect of the Ukrainian case, and not only the Ukrainian, but very basically that his politics for very many years was led by the same um, principle as, that, as the one that was ad advocated by Viktor Orban. And I think there is, in Steinmeier, there is a... Um, um, there, there, there is, as I said, there is a willingness to, ad to admit this and to see this, but there is also a mis misperception that is maybe systematic, because very much of his uh, politics has been so much focused on Russia that there is even that he is even not able to see the neglect of Ukraine and other countries that the um, Ukrainian ambassador is accusing him of. So, in this regard, I just wanted to say that this is the German case. We might have similar cases. I don't think that the case in Italy or France or other European countries is so substantially, fundamentally different, but the German case is the one I know best. When thinking about today, this was somehow my, my <laughs> introduction for this, when thinking about today, when thinking about 1989 and 2022, and also when thinking about my own biography, I'm old enough to have experienced the events of 1989, Kate said in 1990, when this conference here at the IWM took place, I was in Berlin. I was in Berlin before. I came to Berlin in 1988. I started studying at the university that was called the Free University, a name that derives from the, uh, from, uh, the, American, uh, this is the American heritage to Berlin, West Berlin. I was in West Berlin. Started studying. One remarkable thing, and this will be something that is <laughs> interesting to Kate especially, one remarkable thing, at that time, 1988, in West Germany, when you started studying Slavic languages or Slavic studies, uh, there was one single university that was the University of Mainz, which had a so-called Polonicum, 
where you could start with Polish as the first language. All other German universities has had obligatory Russian as the first Slavic language. No exception. This is very different today, but just to, to tell a bit about the background. That was my background when I started studying in the 19, 1988. That was the opening of 1989. I could go over to East Berlin. I could go and study at the Humboldt University. I did so already in 1990. So maybe in 1990 when this conference took place, I was sitting in a seminar at Humboldt University. Uh, um, surprisingly, very surprisingly, I think the situation regarding this special case of the uh, um, awareness of Eastern European, other Eastern European languages than Russian, Slavic languages, was uh, not very different in Germany East and Germany West. I made the very same experiences there. There was this very great focus also in what used to be East Berlin on Russian. The, the, the very same. Maybe even if I would compare it, and I was thinking about it today, I think Maybe there was even a gr greater awareness uh, for other languages in East, in former East Berlin than in West Berlin. I think this is somehow remarkable. And remarkable is also that these things have not only changed over recent years, but they are changing now. And we are speaking about 1989 and 2022 as years that changed, change the face of Europe. The happenings in Ukraine, wherever they will g lead to, whatever will be the result of it. I think this awareness, creating an, affair, an awareness for the Ukrainian nation, for Ukrainian language, this is unchangeable. I think this we have already achieved now. And in that regard, and one can have very different perspectives as, as Tim tried to outline them in the beginning, but in that regard, I think whatever will be the outcome, but this year, 2022, will in a certain sense, be a continuation of 1989. The mental landscape of Europe, and especially, and I, this is what I, the only thing I can speak about, because I'm coming from this West-West Germany, you know, but the, the, the mental landscape for Western Europeans drastically changed in 1989. And I think it is about, once again, to drastically change this year, 2022. Maybe two more short remarks I wanted to do, or should I, if it's too long, let me know. Uh, maybe two more short remarks. Um, one thing, obviously, that comes to mind with 1989 is the mass protests, the demonstrations, the people on the street. Uh, I still remember the night, uh, the night, the one night in Berlin of 1989. I still, I mean, this is, I'm shivering <laughs> somehow still. It's, it's, it's incredible. All these many people on the streets. And what we have seen over recent years is very similar happenings uh, in, uh, especially in two countries, in Belarus and in Ukraine, Minsk and Kiev, to just give it a, the name of these two cities. Um, what we saw in 1989, when I, or before 1989, uh, already in the 80s, when I started to study Slavic languages as well, there was this huge euphoria for everything Russian, perestroika, I mean, Gorbachev was the hero. And what we experienced at that time was an abstention of Moscow to interfere in the politics of the, of the countries, to the very big surprise of one, some of the so socialist leaders, like, for example, Erich Honecker, the, the abstention. What we have seen now in Belarus and Ukraine is the intervention of Moscow in both these countries. In one case, let's say it's somehow successfully, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Minsk, in the other case, in the Ukrainian ca case, less successfully so. And we see the massive intervention of now. One thing that comes to mind also when speaking about this protest, the protest of 89 and all the years after, is the surprising, uh, uh, surprisingly little participation in similar protests in Russia that we were all hoping for. I still find this a very remarkable thing, and I will keep it short, but this, this is remarkable, and this is something that we should talk about. We should also speak about the, the role of Russia in general. There's very good reasons to call this Put Putin's war, as very many do know. There's also very good reasons to call this Russia's war. And when the latest Levada uh, polls show that two-thirds of the uh, Russian uh, population feel pride, happiness and enthusiasm about the current developments. 
despite and taking into account all the misinformation that we all know, so and so on, there is something wrong. And there is very many people writing about this now, and especially Russian immigrants writing about this, Russian writers writing about what has gone wrong in their country over the last 20 years. One final remark, and this brings me back to IWM, and we have, we have set up this uh, exhibition, Kate, and uh, we were, as, as uh, um, Darius uh, um, just uh, noticed, I mean, we were reading through all the comments. It was a wonderful experience to read through, also a funny experience in some, th some sense. Um, what this institute is, or what is the DNA of this institute, is uh, uh, a, like the, the, the heritage of Eastern European dissidents, also of some Eastern European philosophers, people, Josef Tischer. Tischner is a patron to this institute. You will also see him on the portraits in the exhibition. Another one is Jan Patochka, the Czech uh, philosopher. And Jan Patochka became somewhat famous with the Charter 77, signing it and dying shortly after. And his main principle to do what he did was do what has to be done. There is a moral obligation. Sometimes there are cases, there are instances when there is no alternative, no other choice. Do what has to be done. And, what I, and with this I will conclude. What I find most remarkable about the happenings right now is that we are in a very similar situation today in Ukraine. Do what has to be done. And there is a return of something as old-fashioned as truth. Volodymyr Zelensky is always saying, weapon, our weapon is truth, and it is a very successful, surprisingly successful weapon. What we are seeing is maybe a certain ending of this often proclaimed era of post-truth. There is a new understanding of truth, of authenticity, and funnily, this new authenticity is embodied by an actor. <laughs> this, is, this is really great. And uh, uh, if, if the classical definition of the actor by Diderot is uh, uh, the actor should only imitate persons or people, but he should never really allow to act out the, the, the passions because then he would be totally exhausted. But we had the same in Vel Zelensky in 2019. He said in an interview uh, that also politics is like acting, but it's just bad acting. This was his, his <laughs> statement from 2019. We have seen a totally different person with the advent of this war and the return of um, authenticity, and authenticity and truth is back on the stage of world politics. And this, I think, is one of the core messages that this institute was also about. Thank you, You know, all three of you have raised ways in which this conference, the themes of this conference echo in the discussions we're having today. I think I wanted to bring out just a few of them and perhaps we could talk a little bit more about them before we open up for questions. And one of these, Tim, you made a, it, the, your phrase, the platonic essence of Europe when you were speaking about Geremek and how he saw Europe, right? I think this is um, one of the discussions that permeated the conference was what is Europe going to be? Right? There was this discussion, is it going to be Gorbachev's European house? Is it going to be something that's confined to the European community? How, how are we going to see that? What does this platon how has this plat discussion or idea of the platonic essence of Europe evolved? Right? What would it mean today? We talk about Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia. What would that mean today? Um, before I come to that, let me just point out that we have an actor Volodymyr Zelensky, but of course in 1989 we had a playwright, Václav Havel, uh, who was a key figure. So we went from the playwright to the actor. And it's not accidental because yes. Havel himself wrote very well about the, the similarity of politics and theatre. So, so, so it's, a, it's a good place to start. And indeed, Ronald Reagan, somebody mm -hmm. mentioned. Yes, yes, there we are. Look, um, here's, here's the sort of um, the, the, the irony or, or paradox of the way Europe was talked about then and potentially now. Um, Central Europeans behind the Iron Curtain talked about Europe in this very philosophical way. I mean, I myself would never say Europe is a platonic essence, but, you know, Patochka and others wrote about Europe in this very philosophical way. But what they wanted was to be members of the European Union. 
So in practice, that's a real Europe for us, and we need to be in it. And uh, people like Mitterrand turned around and say, well, Europe is not. You don't need to be in the European Union. Europe is a philosophical essence. It's a broader idea. It's a great family. So you can be happy. And do you remember he tried to launch? I was present at the attempted launch of something called the European Confederation, uh, which he tried to launch in Prague Castle. Um, poor old Václav Havel um, realized that he was being sold a pup by Mitterrand and so rapidly retreated from this idea. And I'm glad to say we managed to so demolish the idea in the course of that uh, conference that, um, that uh, Mitterrand's uh, front man ended up talking about un structure très léger, très très léger, so light it became invisible. Um, and and we're, 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 we're sort of experiencing, in a way, that Bal paradox again today, it seems to me, in that uh, Ukrainians are talking in very idealistic and moral and principled terms about Europe, but actually the things that Zelensky repeats every time he talks to an EU leader and puts in every tweet is, accept us as a candidate for the EU. And the leaders of the EU meeting in Versailles says, you are part of the European family, you belong to the, your place is in Europe, your future is in Europe. We're not actually going to commit to your being a member of the EU. So in a way, it's, it's a replay of the same, which by the way, I firmly be believe will end in the same way. After the EU, the most reluctant empire in history, has exhausted all possible reasons for saying no and all possible causes for delay, it will finally accept it. We will wait for that day. Um, that is, you talked about cycles, right? Thinking in cycles as a historian. I also wonder, in a certain sense, this is also a story about trajectories, right? And so we come at this moment when the trajectory is in a certain sense being dictated by the title of the conference, right? On its way to, on the way to democracy. And yet on the other sense, in the other hand, individual trajectories within that are very much open. So if you think about the folks who appear at this conference and where they go from there, what, how do these cycles relate with trajectories, individuals within these bigger transitional moments? Well, first I think in terms of generations, the generation that made it, and actually, some of them were older and some of them were younger. You know, Kowakowski was much older than Michnik was. You know, he was relatively young when he started his career. He was, a, he was still a teenager when Gomułka, the head of the Communist Party, criticized him publicly, which was a great honor which is to the present. So uh, uh, thinking in terms of generation, this, this generation, by the way, baby boomers, largely the most important generation in European history after the Second World War, Everything good and bad, they did it. Uh, as some, in some countries, they're still doing it. So I think that um, uh, there comes a moment of certain replacement by a younger and a new generation. And I don't think that there is... I don't mean I don't see them. Mm. I just think that we cannot yet recognize them. Mm. We don't have the, the analytical instruments to, to recognize what is important in these new generations, what they want. Uh, what they are able and ready to achieve. Uh, I think the, the major difference, you know, watching the, for example, demonstrations in Poland in defense of the rule of law, mm -hmm. I was a little bit disappointed seeing too many of my friends, mm -hmm. people, you know, 50 plus, you know, the, the usual suspects, who were basically doing what they were doing in the 1980s. But there was a moment at one of the demonstrations in front of the presidential palace in Warsaw. You know, I, I returned to Warsaw and I noticed that the median age of the participant in the rally was something like 20 years lower than usually. So I started asking you know, these young people, including my, my children, my sons, who were also there. And they said that someone just organized it on Facebook and, and, and you know, the, the social platforms. And uh, it was very apolitical. They kept politicians of the previous generations at a distance. They, actually, they, they, for, they, it was forbidden for them to enter the platform of these young people. But that was a flash mob. There was a capacity among the young people to very quickly organize, and that's it. They did something, 
There was no continuation. So Yatsek, I, I, it was really said that Yatsek Kurani was no longer with us, with his saying that instead of burning the committees of the, com of the Communist Party, establish your own. Mm -hmm. They don't have the skill or the tradition or inclination to make lasting institutions. So uh, uh, this is not to criticize the younger generation. They will have somehow to deal with it. Uh, but I don't know what will be the ways of eff effectively doing it. Uh, hopefully, actually, you know, maybe the, the, the lesson of Ukrainians will be, will be fought for. That you know, Ukrainians, for example, managed to have an army right before the, the, the present invasion, which they didn't have in, uh, eight, years, eight years ago. So this is, is speaking in terms of, 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 of the cycles. Uh, one more, which is uh, history is back. And I'm, this is a revenge of historians against political scientists and social scientists <laughs> in general. You know, the, the grand terrorists are, are no, longer, uh, no longer there. Uh, I'll do as uh, uh, very much like, like, like Geremek, who was uh, a pessimist because of being historian, a medieval historian. I, I cannot be optimistic. But maybe exactly because my formative experience was 1980s and 1989, I'm hopeful without any strong reason, I must say. On the generations, because it's a really interesting point. There's a really interesting difference between the 68ers and 89. 68ers were people who were young in 68, and they made the movement, the Soissons Vitard. The people who made the history of 89, most of the people on these pictures, were not young. They were many of them 68ers or older than that. Some of them were 39ers, those whose formative experience, like Kiramex, had been in the Second World War. And so most of the people, you know, active at that time were, were of an older generation. So the 89ers are actually people like you, Darius, and um, Ivan Krastev and Tim Snyder. They're people who were young in 89. Um, you know, 17, 20, 23, that sort of age, and for whom 89 was a formative experience, but not as an active participant, right? Um, but then your generation, which in a way is now the generation which is predominant in European public life, is absolutely shaped by that experience of 89, although they weren't the, the makers of it. And now what you have is a generation we've been working on, working with in Oxford, what I call the post-89ers, or what in South Africa, after apartheid, they wonderfully called the born frees, people who were actually born into a, a free Europe. And I think the really interesting question is what their political formation and activism is going to be. Interesting. I wanted to, if any... Mm. Before we open the floor to questions, Ludger, one of the things that came to mind is you were c remarking on the sort of hierarchies of language teaching, right? Made me think of the hierarchies that were very obvious at this conference itself. In terms of the, um, there was a sort of distinction between those experts who had come to share their knowledge to a certain sense, and those who were from these countries that were on the path, on in the midst of transition, who themselves, in fact, if you read back now, are the ones who had some of the most profound and most insightful things to say. How do you see, I, I mean, you also have read all of these. Can, can you reflect a little bit on how you interpreted that as you were reading and how that might apply in this moment today mm -hmm. as well? Uh, I think the most important thing you already said in your question when we were reading through all of these statements made at the conference uh, you, as you said, there were the outside experts, and uh, as it turned out, I think they, m many of them, some of them were those who were really uh, the ones that were uh, going wrong in their expertise. And uh, the most uh, touching uh, um, statements we had from those people who were speaking about their experiences before 1989 and after 1989, and I remember uh, uh, the Czech politician Jan Rummel, uh, we were we had divided, <laughs> so to say, in uh, translating the articles and so on. And I happened to have him, <laughs> and uh, speaking about the experience in the Ministry of the Interior in Prague, uh, sitting on the same, in, in, actually in the same room and actually on the same chair as all these people who had persecuted him 
before, uh, very, very touching observations in this. Uh, and what we have in the exhibition, and this is what maybe I can say this, you will say this at the end, but what we have in the exhibition is if later on you go around, uh, we have the QR codes, scan the QR codes, and you will have short statements by very many of the people present on the pictures. And we have reduced it to like one-minute statements, 30-second one-minute uh, statements. Uh, really, really remarkable things. And uh, um, yeah, it was, it was a great experience to do, to do this exhibition. I don't want to keep us here too long, but I would like to do one round at least of questions. So we'll collect three questions and then give them to the panelists. The microphone will be coming around. And we'll start with Mika in the back. I'm glad to see you back here. Very happy to be back also. And thank you very much for all these uh, information and discussion uh, so far. I want to uh, challenge the comment about the generations in Poland. I'm a feminist, so that's why. So I think when you think these younger generations are not political, are you looking at the right people? The streets of Poland have been full of women, young and old, uh, acting against all these under-gender actions of the Polish government. I happen to know quite a lot of them. They are very political. In case you would think, which I don't think you do, uh, that feminism is kind of like a one issue kind of thing that's only about gender, uh, it's not. So uh, you see, for instance, now with all the refugees from Ukraine, that this is the networks that, that engage, because you know that it's not a Polish state no, taking care of the refugees. It's civil society in Poland doing that. Um, they're, they're behind the strongest organizers of that. So, so those movements is a very intersectional movement that cares about other inequalities than gender just as much as they care about gender. And, and they are strong, strongly political and combine or move across uh, generations. And if I have hope about Polish democracy, it's because of them. So it would be nice to hear your ideas about that. Thank you. We'll collect a couple more. I saw a question there. Thank you very much. I'm very appreciative of these excellent statements that we have heard so far. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask the historian first, uh, my colleague Timothy, about a question that relates to the current situation, but it's also a historical question. One of the common formulations that has been used over the past few years is reference to a rules-based international order. Now, I may be wrong, I haven't gone into it, but I do not believe that that was a common expression before 1989. Um, and it wasn't then, it certainly wasn't used during the revolutionary events of 89-90 either. There were other things going on. I'm suspecting that it was of later origin. And it might be useful to think about now because one of the central pillars of the legitimacy of what has been called the West is uh, indeed an example of rules-based international order and that's so-called international law uh, I say so-called because it seems to me that we're reaching, we have reached the limits of its enforceability or we are, we need to ask if we have or not. That's the way I should probably put it in the case of Ukraine. We know that Russia has broken international law, in fact violated the most sacred principle of international law which is the, uh, the, forbidden, the forbidding of aggressive war. Um, so what does one do about that in order to restore the idea that a rules-based international order actually means something? There are four possible solutions. I'm not going to, have a, not going to talk, give a talk, one sentence each. Uh, the first is the United Nations. We've just learned yet again how worthless the United Nations is in this kind of situation. The five permanent members of the Security Council appear to be 
exempt from international law, um, period. <laughs> Second remedy, uh, the Hague. Um, this is clearly a remedy, but only after you have defeated someone or that person has been pushed from power. This is not likely in the case of Putin. Third remedy, economic sanctions. We're in the middle of those now. It doesn't look like they're going far enough, although they've done, been far more successful than anyone thought they would. But it doesn't seem to me that they ever have yet been effective in restoring the legitimacy of international law. Fourth and final remedy. We're not there yet, and not, no one's mentioning yet, it yet, is a complete, complete um, break, both economically and commercially, but also diplomatically with Russia. No one's talking about it, but I wanted to have mentioned to... it as a possibility and simply ask, where are we with respect to the legitimacy of international law? Thank you. And then in the back, I saw one last question. Yes. Hi. Um, uh, thanks for, for uh, fascinating talks. Um, I want to return for a minute for that, uh, to that idea of Europe, right? And maybe uh, between Brexit and the war in Ukraine, uh, nothing could have saved the EU uh, more than those two crises because... Obviously, when we talk about Europe, we talk, as you said, about uh, the idea of Europe. We talk about the institutional uh, side of uh, the EU. But uh, when all of these are um, uh, put together as, as this uh, concept of democratization and liberalization and, um, uh, and the, what it does for uh, Central uh, European countries we shouldn't forget that it's also neoliberalization and a very um, fierce economic shifts that come with, a, with the, the, the EU. So I was just wondering how that side of the, of the EU a, plays into a, some of what we're seeing here and maybe some of the reluctance that a, people both in Europe, but uh, also in the uh, uh, in what is now the emerging Central European countries are feeling towards uh, uh, the prospect of uh, joining the EU. Thank you, Tim. I'll let you take a first crack at this. Okay, I'm not sure whether the comment about the young generation in Poland was addressed to me or Darius Stola, but I'll take it anyway because I don't want you to misunderstand me to say that they are inactive. The so-called black protests against the tightening of the abortion law in Poland were some of the most impressive Poland, um, uh, demonstrations Poland has seen for 30 years. Uh, so, of course, that generation is active. This project we've done in, with the Dandor program at Oxford is looking precisely what young Europeans do mobilize for. They mobilize for climate change, against, against climate change, and uh, social justice issues. So there's certainly mobilization. What is not so clear is how that plays into politics in the sense of parties, elections, governments, and what they do. That, that, that's still the question mark for me. To, to my namesake, Mitchell Ash. I mean, just very briefly, firstly, just historically, if you do a Google Gram, Ngram, or, or, or LexisNexis search, you find that indeed the terms rules based um, uh, international order and liberal international order peak in the 1990s and 2000s. And so while we imagine they go way back to the 1940s, this is, that's when we most talked about them. I think it's a huge achievement that we, Slobodan Milosevic ended his days in front of The Hague. I've signed a petition for a special tribunal to be set up for the war crimes in Ukraine. I would love to see um, Vladimir Putin end up in front of it. The difference is that even as we say we all condemn the war criminal Vladimir Putin, the ambassadors of China, India, and South Africa, two of them being democracies, are happily meeting with Vladimir Putin because the temptation to punch the West in the nose 
is even stronger than any condemnation of what he's doing, so that the, the, the geopolitical balance, the correlation of forces, has just changed enormously. Very quickly on Europe, because it's an enormous uh, subject. Look, of course, the drastic inequalities, social and economic inequality, that emerged since the 1990s have done enormous damage to Europe. Think of the north-south divide in the Eurozone. By the way, wrongly, I think, attributed only to neoliberal ideology. It's a mistake to think that we were all neoliberals in, at that conference in 1990. Geremek and Havel and Mazowiecki were nothing. They were social democrats, broadly speaking. They just thought, that's the way you make a market economy. That's what people like Jeff Sachs told them. But we can learn from their mistakes. One of the most prescient people at this conference was Alexander Smola, a great friend of this institution, who said there are going to be huge social costs to this transition, and we need the state, the welfare state, to compensate for them. At the beginning of the Polish transition, there was a guy called Jacek Kuron, who was the left hand of the transition, who cared for the weak and those who were losing and suffering, and there was a guy called Leszek Basarowicz, who was the right hand of the transition, making the market economy. Unfortunately, within a few years, the left hand almost disappeared the socially caring side disappeared, and the right hand remained punching away. So I think when we're thinking about transitions, very different transitions in countries like Ukraine and Moldova, a certain pragmatism, a concern to pay attention to the social costs is going to be very important indeed. Final comment, since I imagine this is the final round. Um, one way to keep Europe on the road is to have a big project. It says, I think, in the Talmud somewhere. Everything is in the Talmud. If you don't know where to go, where you want to go, any road is good. And for the last 15 years, Europe really hasn't known where it wants to go. So I think if we once again return to embrace the great project of enlargement, the greatest success story of the European project, bar none, the aspiration of a Europe whole and free that embraces not just East Central Europe, but Eastern Europe. Um, that will be good not just for them, but also for us. Thank you. If I can only follow up on what Timothy has said, that indeed the black protests two years ago now were the, actually the biggest political demonstrations in, in democratic Poland. But uh, again, they did not lead to any stable political organization. There was no follow there were attempts at follow up to make to build organizations on the basis of it. Not very successful so far. I'm pretty sure that that was a formative experience for a whole generation of young people, especially young women in Poland, but it's yet to be seen into what political actions this may translate. If any, there is a peculiar kind of anti political politics in this generation, much different to the anti politics of the Havel, of the Havel generation, certain distance towards it, uh, which, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's one of the reasons why we still have the populist party in charge in, in Poland. So, despite this mass protest, they, they, they won again. Uh, so, it, it remains to be seen if and if, yes, what kind of political forms of political organization they will find for themselves. Well, I think there was no Ooh. direct question, but uh, um, yeah, I, I can also only, only follow, up, follow up what both of them already said and speaking about the European Union. Um, it sounds pathetic and we have a hesitation to for these pathetic things. Tim also has a hesitation. I noticed in <laughs> what you said. Um, but Really, I think if this is this this the case. The future of Europe now, today, is decided in Ukraine, and uh, the European freedom is defended in Ukraine today. And you discussed this yesterday, Tim Gordnesh and and Kate. You were on the stage and discussed the possible accession of the Ukraine to the European Union. Uh, we will see a long and probably difficult process, uh, but I mean, very clearly, so it should end positively. But 
that was also maybe what I tried to, to or wanted to say today. It is not only political decisions, but it is also about cultural implications. Mm -hmm. And what is most importantly, and what has already changed and is uh, can cannot be done back, the mental landscape of Europe has changed. And there's very interesting uh, uh, studies, as you may know, there were interesting studies before 89, what people think about how far cities are away from them. And this is the miscalculation is really stunning. And I mean, this is one thing that ha has happened over recent weeks. Uh, we will not uh, do these miscalculations anymore in regards to Ukraine. This is a fact. Thank you to the three of you very much for this. I just wanted, before we close here, to say a little bit more about the exhibition. Darish and Ludger, actually all three of you have already mentioned it. The, photo the photographs were taken by the Viennese photographer Renate Apostel. Um, she captured the conference throughout. Um, we. Ludger, Sarah Hayes, and I worked together to curate this exhibition, um, which selected what we saw as some of the most representative and also remarkable photographs from this. The photos themselves are handmade prints on barite paper developed from the original negatives, which we are lucky enough to have by the young Viennese photo artist Andre Kasik. Um, I just wanted to say also a little bit about um, what a remarkable um, team effort this exhibition was, and so I wanted to thank some of the people who were involved in it. Ludger and Sarah, first and foremost, it was a pleasure to work on this with you. But I also wanted to thank David Suchek, our longtime IT man in-house, who has a remarkable knowledge of all of these people and who helped us identify them. Klaus Nellen, thank you as well for your assistance with this, and also thank you for taking part in the conference. And it, we can't end without saying that as part of this conference, one of the outcomes of this conference is some of the contributions to the first edition of Transit, um, which emerged soon after this, the Institute's long-running intellectual journal. You're very welcome to take a look at that as well in our library. As we walk through the building, feel free to go down to the cafeteria for wine and cheese, proceed through the building to take a look at these photographs. Um, as we've said, they are, many of them are accompanied by some of the indelible voices of this conference. We have the original audio recordings, which you can access by scanning the QR codes with your phone. They are presented in the original language. It was a multilinguistic conference, English, German, Russian, Czech, and Polish, plenty of Polish. You will also see the text of those along with an English translation for those of you who may not speak that language. Um, I am happy to walk with people through the building. I've worked with these photographs for quite a while now. I know the exhibition well. I'm happy to tell the stories that have emerged from the archives that we've read from the transcripts. So please enjoy, we're glad you're here. Thank you for being here.